Hello and welcome to Citizen Watchdog Presents, our week of webinar series, a uh, project of the Franklin Center for Government and Public Integrity. We've had a great week hearing some from, uh, from some phenomenal speakers, and we're very pleased to be joined today by Kitty Pavlich, who is the news editor at townhall.com and the New York Times bestselling author of Fast and Furious, Barack Obama's bloodiest scandal, and a shameless uh, cover-up. Thank you so much for being with us today, Thanks Katie. Thanks for we having me. It. Always love what the Franklin Center does, so thank you Well, so I know much. we've had you here talking on this topic before, and uh, hopefully we have some new viewers, so I was hoping we could open by just um, talking a little bit about Fast and mm -hmm. Furious. Uh, I think, unfortunately, this is a story that too few people know the details about, right. and even some people uh, may not know of in, in general. So we'd love to have you give the basics of exactly what is Fast and Furious and why should people know about it. Well, basically, the, the basic overview of Fast and Furious is that the Department of Justice, under the leadership of Attorney General Eric Holder, uh, trafficked 2,500 high-powered AK-47 50 caliber rifles into Mexico without telling the Mexican government about it and by using uh, law-abiding gun dealers uh, to do so. Um, there, you know, there was a lack of, of watching these guns and where they were going, and those 2,500 weapons were lost. And the reason we know about this is because one of our own Border Patrol agents, Brian Terry, was killed, and guns from this program were left at his murder scene, not in Mexico, but in the United States. Um, and so you know, that happened in December of 2010. It's now almost December of 2012, and we still don't have a lot of answers about what happened. And so for the past 18 months, um, you know, one of my main projects, and, and like Eric mentioned, hasn't gotten a lot of media coverage. Um, but there are a few of us who have been working very hard on getting uh, people the information that they need about it. And the reason they should care is because this is a situation where the Department of Justice, with the, through the use of ATF, really had no regard for uh, the value of human life and, and disregarded uh, the public safety and uh, went completely against what the mission of ATF is to carry out this program. Um, and to this day, you know, there's two sets of players, which I know we'll get into later. Um, but to this day, a lot of ATF officials who were supervising this program, and especially DOJ officials, do not believe that they did anything wrong. And so, you know, what people like the Franklin Center do is they, they get people to ask all the right questions, and without the questions being asked from, you know, not so traditional journalists in this case, we wouldn't be hearing a lot about uh, the answers. Great. And I just want to remind our viewers that you can ask Katie questions by emailing me at Telford, that's T-E-L-F-O-R-D, at franklincenterhq.org. And hopefully that graphic is up on the screen. Uh, please email us your questions. We'd love to uh, engage Katie and, and hear from all of you in our audience today as well. You can also follow Katie at Katie Pavlich on Twitter or ask questions of uh, me and her via my Twitter account, Blame Telford, as well. So please email us or tweet us your questions. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Katie, just... Looking at, this, uh, looking at this scandal and talking a little bit about the players, mm -hmm. uh, who would you say are the villains, who are the victims, and, and who are the heroes in this story? Right. Well, I'm really glad that you uh, brought this up because I break down ATF and the Justice Department this way. I call it suits and boots. And the boots are the guys who are in the field, the ATF agents who are actually running down criminals um, and throwing uh, dangerous people behind jail and for good reason. Now, they are the ones who are more of the whistleblowers. And then you have the suits, who are the guys who don't have any field experience with an ATF. They aren't out in the field with scratched up badges running down criminals, and they sit at desks all day and delegate duties. The suits kind of get into ATF and the Department of Justice with the goal of someday heading the bureaucracy, whereas the, the boots and the ATF field agents on the ground are the ones willing to do the dirty work and uphold the rule of law. Now, some of the players here are, you know, former uh, ATF special agent in charge of the Phoenix Field Division, Bill, Mc Bill Newell, who has been named um, as someone who should be referred for discipline. He still doesn't think that he did anything wrong. Um, one situation that we've encountered, and this goes into Franklin's mission, is some, you know, further corruption as a result of Fast and Furious with a man named ATF uh, agent uh, Bill McMahon, and he used to be in charge of the uh, operations for the West during Fast and Furious, what was going on. And he was transferred, uh, although he was involved in this very uh, fatal operation, he was then transferred to uh, the, the Department of Public Accountability or Public Integrity. So he was transferred to the Ethics Division of the ATF uh, <laughs> Bureau, um, even though he had been engaged in and, and possibly, you know, he's been named for possible perjury in front of Congress, yet they transferred him to head up uh, some public integrity there. And so 
with that, um, we found out recently that he was approved through ATF, the top people at ATF approved for him to double dip. So he's been receiving a, a salary from taxpayers despite the possible perjury, despite the um, horrific incidents of Fast and Furious, he's been receiving this taxpayer salary. He was approved to also receive a six-figure salary from J.P. Morgan. So he's been working for taxpayer, you know, working with taxpayer salary, double dipping in private funds through J.P. Morgan, and it just so happens that J.P. Morgan owns the credit cards that ATF uses. This was approved at the highest levels of ATF post, you know, most of the hearings on Fast and Furious, post the new ATF director saying he was going to clean things up, and turns out that the highest officials really were just approving him to be taking advantage of taxpayers while working a private sector job with no consequences of his actions um, throughout the scandal. And so those are, you know, two of the main guys I would say are the, you know, the villains. I would say the heroes, obviously Brian Terry, um, who was killed. Um, I don't give a lot of credit to politicians most of the time, but I think uh, uh, Chairman of the House Oversight Committee, Daryl Issa, has done an excellent job at asking questions and continuing the push, regardless of the stonewalling that we've seen. And then the whistleblowers, John Dodson, um, I'll get into his role a little later, <clears throat> and Vince Sheffaloo, who actually started an ATF uh, whistleblower website a couple years ago, which led to the information being available to the public about um, Fast and Furious in the first place. I think it's so easy for folks to lose sight of uh, this scandal as something that's maybe about government incompetence or ethical lapses, but there really is a, a human toll here. And you mentioned Brian Terry, who's you know probably the most prominent face in terms of somebody who actually lost his life because of this program and the scandal. Uh, do you know of any efforts uh, on behalf of Brian Terry or his family to support them, any funds or ways that citizens can get involved to uh, right. spread the word about that? Well, the Brian Terry Foundation is one that, that was recently founded officially, and uh, they take funds and, 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 and use that for um, families to be able to come to the hearings to ask questions about what's going on. Uh, I, I believe it's for legal fees as well, and also just to get to the bottom of the scandal and really support people who are trying to ask the right questions. So the Brian Terry Foundation is the main way that you can get in touch with the family. I think they have t-shirts for sale, they have bumper stickers for sale where you can show your support and donate some money to their cause. Fantastic. Well, you know, this has been, as I said, a scandal that has not been effectively covered by the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Aside from your terrific coverage, and I know a handful of others who've really aggressively pursued this story, how has the mainstream media reacted uh, were they willing participants in covering this? Were they right. dragged kicking and screaming? And do you feel that the coverage that they've provided uh, since this became a, a nationally prominent issue has been adequate? I do not think it's been adequate. Um, I do want to, you know, going back to the human toll real quickly and tying it into the media, um, the media has pretty much ignored this up until the point of um, covering it a little bit, but not covering it in the ways that they do. Uh, CNN has a lot of um, resources to go into Mexico to do the job that you know smaller bloggers maybe can't do, uh, but they've refused. And I want to uh, you know tip my hat to Univision, who recently did a big um, documentary where they went into Mexico, and, and you should know that Mexico is now the number one country in the world for assassinations of journalists. So they they literally list, risk their lives to go into Mexico and get this story. And um, you know, they really showed us that the types of people that the government was arming are the kinds of people who were going into teenagers' birthday parties and mowing down everyone there because they had a problem with one. Um, you know, these people were assassinating government officials. And so the coverage hasn't been uh, significant. It's been, I, I say that the media has been complicit in the cover-up, and I talk about that extensively in the book. Um, and as a matter of fact, you know, Time Inc. is being sued by one of the whistleblowers at this point because a woman named Catherine Ebon, who wrote a big, you know, expose about Fast and Furious um, for Fortune magazine, um, you know, that's what the media ran with. And she took the side of these corrupt DOJ officials, even though she portrayed herself like most mainstream journalists do as a middle-of-the-road kind of reporter. It turns out she's a former Clinton campaign staffer, uh, which we found out through, of course, new media. Um, and, you know, the, the media had ignored it until her report came out where her original thesis was that ATF never allowed guns to walk. That wasn't the intention, uh, when all of the evidence shows the opposite. CNN ran with it. MSNBC ran with it. They portrayed it as this big six-month-long investigation while they ignored all of the other reporting by myself and other, other people. Um, 
And so, you know, this John Dotson is suing them because he believes that they that she smeared um, his his reputation, and the mainstream media ran with her story. So I think he deserves an apology from all of them on that. What's really been amazing here is that we see a lot of coverage in the media of things like Solyndra, and that's you know just a bankruptcy. That's just an abuse of taxpayer money. But there are actually lives here, and it's not right. it's not being talked about. Well, I think you know we, you and I both know that, uh, like you said, it has a human death toll. And when you really get into the details of what happened here, it's very obvious that this administration was willing to use humans as collateral damage to push a policy agenda similar to what we're seeing in Benghazi now. There's, you know, the, the Obama administration cover-up playbook has been played in Fast and Furious, has been played in, in Benghazi. There's many similarities there for political reasons. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, the media didn't want to cover it because of the human toll. You know, money is something people can get over. They can talk in big, and it's horrible anyway, but they can talk in big terms. You know, $500 million is a big number to grasp. People don't necessarily see that coming straight out of their wallet, so they don't feel like it affects them. But when you're talking about someone who might be your son or people who live in Arizona and California and New Mexico and Texas and know that the border is not secure and people who have um, people in law enforcement, um, family members in law enforcement who are saying, my family goes out to risk their lives every day, and the U.S. government was arming their enemies. Um, it becomes a major problem, and the media wasn't willing to expose that because it would have huge implications for President Obama. Absolutely. No, we know that you know, despite a lack of coverage among the mainstream media, the story has been getting out there a lot, a lot through online channels. How did it first percolate to the surface? How did it first uh, reach public awareness? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you've stepped in with coverage. Other people have been uh, talking about it, but what were kind of those first signs that got people to connect dots and discover that something was happening here? Right. Well, as I mentioned earlier, Vince Sheffalu, who is a, uh, a ATF whistleblower who was recently fired in the parking lot of Denny's by ATF for telling the truth under oath. Uh, he's since been, uh, you know, said that he's going to get his job back. But he started this uh, whistleblower site, which ATF bosses, the suits, didn't like too much. And it was an anonymous website where ATF agents from all over the country could come anonymously because the Bureau has a long record of retaliation against anyone who jumps their chain of command. He started this website. They were talking about it. As soon as Brian Terry was killed, the law enforcement community went on this website and started talking about the, the idea that um, ATF was sending guns into Mexico and, and the ones that were left at his murder scene were a part of that. Then it was picked up by, by two bloggers named David Cadrea and Mike Vanderborough, and they really started the online trickling of the information. At that point, we started hearing more about it, and then CBS News correspondent Cheryl Ackeson, who's been one of the very few mainstream journalists to, to talk about this, she picked it up and put it on into the television realm, which was very helpful in getting it out to more people. Um, so that's really how it, it started. It really shows the power of one person or a handful of people to start speaking up mm -hmm. and, and get a message out there that wouldn't otherwise be known. Yep. I think you know most of our, our viewers and most of the public probably didn't hear a lot about this scandal until uh, the contempt vote in the House of Representatives for Eric Holder. Right. Uh, we know that President Obama has uh, asserted executive privilege in hiding and uh, refusing to turn over documents to congressional uh, oversight panels. Mm -hmm. What do you think they're hiding and uh, why don't you think they'll turn it over? Well, there's a couple things. Um, I think that there, you know, President Obama has asserted an executive privilege that doesn't necessarily, cov necessarily cover communications between himself and the Attorney General or the Justice Department specifically about this program. But I think that they may have done that to excuse themselves from their role in this. What people don't realize is Fast and Furious was a program that was not just a Justice Department program. It was a DH, you know, a Department of Homeland Security program. The R IRS was involved. The FBI under the Justice Department was involved. Um, Immigration and Customs was, in was involved. Border Patrol was involved. Um, there are multiple government agencies. And guess what? The White House was involved. The White House National Security Team was receiving emails about Fast and Furious. And as soon as that revelation became public during a hearing in the summer of 2011, the main guy, his name is Kevin O'Reilly, who is now back in the United States, but they shipped him over to Iraq and said he was unavailable for comment from congressional investigators and, of course, um, to the press. And so he was made unavailable despite the fact that he was on the national security team for the White House. He was forwarding emails about Fast and Furious to other people on the national security team, including President Obama's senior advisor to Latin America at the time. Um, let's not forget that President Obama made gun trafficking policy a number one priority right out of the gate when he started um, as president. You know, his first big foreign policy push was in Mexico. And so he has a lot more involvement here than he's willing to admit. 
And um, let's not forget that that executive privilege came 15 minutes before the first contempt vote took place. 15 minutes. And you know, the, the thing that's not consistent here, and this is something that is easy to get people on, is, is inconsistency. But President Obama and Eric Holder have argued repeatedly, and Eric Holder said this when the Inspector General's report came out, that Fast and Furious was a low-level, rogue operation carried out by a few agents. Well, first of all, that's untrue because there were gun walking operations in Arizona, there were gun walking operations in Texas, and there were gun walking operations in Florida. Those are the ones that we know about. This is clearly a national program. But going back to their statements, if this was really a low level rogue operation, then why is it necessary for the President of the United States to get involved and assert executive privilege if that's really what happened? Um, there's a lot of evidence to show that this was, it was politically motivated. People died as a result. And they've done everything they can uh, to not give the American people the answers that they deserve. So obviously a, a terrible scandal, terrible death toll and stonewalling at, at every front. Do you feel that uh, these officials will ever be held to account? Will there be justice for those who died? And uh, before you answer that, I just want to remind our viewers, if you have a question for Katie Telford at franklincenterhq.org, and if we could put that graphic back up on the screen, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'd love to get your questions. Uh, so going back to that, do you feel, I know there's a lawsuit going on right now, mm -hmm. um, and, and Congress is still conducting their investigation. Do you feel there will ever be justice? It's a tough question because I want to be optimistic and I do believe in the American system, although it is very corrupt. Um, it's the best one in the world and, and sometimes it does work. As I said, um, you know, the whistleblower Vince Sheffaloo was fired in the Denny's parking lot and the Office of um, Special Counsel stepped in and said, no, you need to give him his job back. And that was an example of the system working. However, uh, what I'm concerned about is Although I don't think that the, you know, we're not done with the investigation. The Oversight Committee still has two reports that are coming out. There's already another hearing with the Inspector General scheduled for January. But what I am concerned about is that a new administration, if Mitt Romney wins, um, or, you know, if, if Barack Obama wins, but the point is if there's a new administration, that um, the new administration will decide um, that it won't be something that they want to deal with. It's a prior administration. Um, I think if President Obama wins, I think that there's more chance for there to be justice just because it's kind of, you know, a, an Obama-type thing. Um, if Ro Mitt Romney gets in, I would hope he doesn't do what President Bush did, and that is push aside all the unethical behavior of the previous administration because they don't want to deal with it politically. Um, and so my fear is that politics will get in the way. Um, it, you know, they'll see it as a political albatross when really this is a matter of um, if you know, people watching this, this webcast lied to Congress or didn't respond to subpoenas, there would be consequences for them. Not to mention there's a whole lot of people who have been killed as a result of this. And Eric Holder's not, you know, he doesn't um, admit much, but he does admit that we will see uh, people being killed as a result of this program for a very long time. I know you've poured through reams of documents, talked to countless individuals, and conducting the research for this book and all the coverage that you've done of this issue. Uh, out of all of the information you've come across, what do you find to be the most shocking aspect of this scandal? I really just think it comes down to the utter disregard for human life. I think that, um, you know, it's not, on a common sense level, it is not difficult to see that if you give criminals the tools that they need uh, to carry out their criminal activities, they're going to do it. Um, you know, we don't pay attention in the United States to what's going on in Mexico, uh, which I think is unfortunate. We talk about a lot uh, what goes on in the Middle East, obviously very important, but what's going on right next door is a, a huge problem. And the people operating there, these cartels, as I've mentioned, are very brutal. They're willing to assassinate government officials because there's no consequences. They're willing to assassinate teenagers at birthday parties. They're willing to dump handless, feetless bodies of men and, and women on the side of the road uh, for intimidation purposes. And so I think that the thing that was most shocking to me was just the utter disregard for human life in Mexico as if the administration didn't find um, those lives valuable. I know many have put forth the, the argument that this scandal is in some way tied to efforts to um, pursue more aggressive gun control policies. Mm -hmm. What are your feelings on that and, and what's kind of the rationale behind that uh, train of thought? Well, there's plenty of evidence to support that, and since um, we focus on media here, I'm going to go back to the media for a little bit. Um, in December of 2010, the same month that Brian Terry was killed, the Washington Post published this huge expose on the secret life of guns. And 
in this article, they were they they listed a number of gun dealerships along the southwest border who were um, allegedly trafficking guns to Mexican cartels. Well, it turns out that at the time, none of us knew about Fast and Furious. We only knew about it after Brian Terry was killed. It turns out that the list of gun dealerships that were listed in that article were the same dealerships that were being used in Fast and Furious. So of course, they were being, they were being blamed publicly for the violence in Mexico. The same ATF officials who were in charge of Fast and Furious and going into these dealerships in 2010 and saying, please sell to these guys. We need you to do this for your country. Were being blamed publicly, quoted in this article, saying that these dealerships were responsible for murder and mayhem in Mexico, despite the fact that the government was forcing them to do it. The same gun dealerships on this list who had the highest number of trafficked guns found at crime scenes in Mexico were the same ones who were being forced by the government to sell to Mexican cartels in the first place. And so that's one thing. You know, publicly ATF officials like Bill Newell, for example, were saying that Gun dealerships are along the southwest border, you know, cartels come shopping in Arizona for their guns, which A, they don't, and B, they weren't being honest about that they had another investigation going on that we now know was fast and furious. And if you look at all the documentation, there's multiple mentions of a new long gun reporting measure. And um, that mean, and they and they got that. I mean, they used Fast and Furious as a justification for putting more regulation on gun dealerships in the southwest border states. And at the beginning of this webinar, you asked about the players in this, this whole thing. And that also ties into uh, the idea of the political argument. Um, former U.S. Attorney in Arizona, Dennis Burke, who resigned about a year ago now, uh, more than a year ago now, he actually helped write up and craft the Clinton-era assault weapons ban with Rahm Emanuel who of course served as President Obama's chief of staff. Um, Eric Holder has this idea that we should brainwash people into disliking guns. President Obama is very anti-gun. And the argument that they were making was guns from the United States border shops, gun dealerships, are ending up at violent crime scenes in Mexico. We need more regulation. And they were doing this over and over again in press conferences, in articles like the Washington Post, publicly smearing these dealerships as if they were criminals when all along they were dangling their license in front of them and saying, if you want to keep your license, you should participate in this program and help your country by selling to the people we tell you to sell to. All while lying to them and saying that no one would get hurt and that cartel members would be arrested. And so there's plenty of evidence to suggest that this was used uh, for political motivation of more gun control because they know it's not something that's um, a political win in terms of actually talking about it. They know what happened in 1994, um, but that doesn't mean that their the ideology doesn't trump other things that they wanted to do. In your work on the book, did you talk to any of those gun dealers, distributors who were involved in the scandal? You know, I, I would imagine uh, they probably feel they share some of the blame, even if they were unwilling participants. What what kind of has their reaction been to this whole thing? Right. Well, they're um, not talking at all because they have um, they need to make a living, and, and it's difficult for them because they feel like they've been used by the government. They're involved in lawsuits as well, but they also make a living by ATF approving their licenses. So they've kind of been caught in this really tough place of being turned into criminals by the government, but they depend on ATF. Um, and the government for their livelihood in terms of their license to operate. So they haven't been talking. I did visit a few of these gun shops, and um, I can tell you that there's a reason why they didn't use a Cabela's, right? These little gun dealerships can't fight back on the, the scale and level that a Cabela's could. Um, they took advantage of, um, of them in that way. Um, but if you look at the, e like you said, email documentation, there's multiple instances of these gun dealers emailing these ATF officials in Phoenix and saying, are you sure you're doing everything you can to make sure that these guns don't end up in the wrong hands? Because I have a lot of friends in Border Patrol, I have a lot of friends in law enforcement, and I'm very concerned about their safety. And ATF wrote back every time and said, don't worry, we're arresting people, these guns aren't going to Mexico, and everything is fine, when all along it wasn't. Very, very interesting. Um, would love to have you tell us a little more about the book. What made you originally, I know you were covering the issue very in depth, uh, you decided a book would be a good idea. What, uh, what was that process like? How long did it take you? What were the fun aspects of it? And what were the most challenging aspects that you encountered? Well, I would say the reason that um, the book came about was I had been covering it anyway for a long time for Town Hall. And um, it was one of those things where I just felt very frustrated with the lack of coverage. And I felt like 
you know, in the 24-hour news cycle, it's very difficult, I believe, to hold people accountable because we see these one-day headlines and the next day it's on to something else. And so there were a lot of headlines and it's a very complicated case and I just felt like it needed to be all put in one place, tying the characters together, tying the events together, t together tying the motivations together and you know, getting people up to speed on what the basics of the program were because although I call them basics, it's very complicated. And I also wanted to get the story into another venue that not necessarily you know, everyone was going to see. You know, people weren't seeing it on the news every day like I feel like they should. Um, they weren't seeing it in their newspapers. And so I felt like getting a book into regular bookstores where people would walk by and see it and be interested was a way that I could reach more people um, in a larger audience, you know, so they would know the details of this because they should be very concerned about it. Um, in terms of what was fun about it, um, it was, you know, it was, it was get, good getting to know some people, you know, it, I'm from Arizona, so it was good to go back home and do a lot of research there on the ground. Um, it was nice getting to know um, some of the ATF whistleblowers and really just getting into, you know, the investigative side of things. And it was, it was you know, a good feeling to know that digging through documents was worth it. Um, other than that, it was difficult. It was difficult to write it in a way that made sense, that covered most of the facts that needed to be covered. Um, and I had to do it in a very short period of time. And so um, and at the time that I wrote it, I was actually covering other things and flying around the country. So I was writing a lot of it on airplanes and, and visiting with people and, and talking to sources. And so um, that was difficult. And I think that you know, getting people to actually talk, and this is something that all journalists um, have to go through, um, developing sources who trust you and who you can trust is a very difficult process and it takes some time um, so you know developing those relationships especially in a situation like this where there is retaliation involved there are lawsuits involved there are gag orders involved there are consequences for saying the wrong thing unfortunately um, it was a very eggshell like process but definitely learned a lot and uh, I was happy to see that it, it can make an impact in another venue of a, a bookstore and in terms of tactics uh, you know Freedom of Information Act requests, developing sources, mm -hmm. um, you know, probably fun elements of having people send you anonymous tips and, and that right. sort of thing. What was kind of your primary method for researching and uncovering all the information that you used? Well, what I would do is I would go to events where I knew a lot of the, the players would be. And that way you can kind of hit them all in the same venue and then branch out from there and set up extra meetings. Um, Freedom of information requests were uh, pretty much ignored, and when they were fulfilled, they were sent back with uh, blank pages or the, the typical letter of, there's nothing what you requested that exists, because uh, as you know, FOIA writing can be uh, very tedious in the sense of they can change one word or say that you left one word out and, and say your request doesn't warrant anything that they have. Um, I would say working with um, outside uh, nonprofits or uh, legal watchdog, watchdog groups like Judicial Watch, they have attorneys who their main job is to write FOIAs and to get information from the government that's difficult to get. So working with them um, can kind of get people more information at a quicker pace in terms of FOIA requests and, and things like that. Um, and so that's kind of the way that I, I gather my information and getting on the ground. I know in the age of the blogosphere, um, and with all due respect, it's easy to think you can do your entire job from your computer, but it's very important to actually get out there and, and talk to people and, and, and meet with people face to face and develop that person to person relationship, even in the era of social media and video and email. I know it's easy to get lost in them. Well, I can do everything from my computer, right? And through the phone. And you do a lot of that, um, but it's also very important to understand that you have to put the time and you have to get your, your boots on the ground and, yep. and actually do the work there. So. And speaking of being able to do everything from your computer, I would remind our viewers to submit your questions via Twitter to either at Kitty Pavlich, at Blame Telford, or you can email us at Telford, or, uh, email us at Telford at FranklinCenterHQ.org. We'd love to hear from all of you, uh, all of you as well. Kitty, do you have any sense if the administration has uh, seen your book, if they've read through it, if they're aware of it, and what their reaction's been? <laughs> well, I, I do because. Um yeah, I'm not sure if the White House level knows about it. Um, however, um, something that we found a couple months ago, and I think I was actually with you at BlogCon when this happened, um, we saw a reporter from the Free Beacon email the Justice Department to ask about a specific question in the book. And the Justice Department emailed back with an official uh, DOJ email address and said, 
you're going to have to refer your question to the FBI. But in the meantime, I've been uh, instructed to give you this link. And it was a link to a, a full-fledged Media Matters hit job on the book, and it didn't even address the specific reporter's question. And so, well, that raised a little bit of a red flag, right? And we had known through previous reports that the White House was working with Media Matters on a regular basis, officials in the White House, to kind of change the news cycle and get their talking points out. So there was a suspicion there that maybe the Justice Department was doing the same thing. Um, a couple months later, uh, Matthew Boyle from the Daily Caller did a big story. Um, he got a FOIA request back, and he clearly got the FOIA written correctly. And he got a whole slew of emails between the Justice Department and Media Matters showing them collaborating together to smear reporters like myself. Daryl Issa called it the, uh, the Obama administration's enemies list. Myself, Matthew Boyle, um, and other reporters that they didn't like, Fox News, for example. And then also to smear whistleblowers. Christian Adams, who is the, the, the uh, whistleblower who, who was once inside the Justice Department, who went out publicly to talk about the process of, of the DOJ dropping the case against the Black Panthers in 2008, getting to be an election season again. He talked about that. And there's emails between the Public Affairs Office, which is funded by taxpayers. The woman's name is Tracy Schmaller, who was in contact with Media Matters. She gets paid six figures a year by people watching this right now. Six figures. And she's working with a far left outlet to not only smear current DOJ employees, to smear whistleblowers, which is against the Whistleblower Protection Act. It's against the law. And also to smear the reputations and to damage the credibility of legitimate reporters who are exposing what they're doing um, because we're embarrassing the administration as if they couldn't do anything else to embarrass themselves, right? Um, so um, I think that they, they are very well aware of it. Um, they're probably not happy about it, but that's the beauty of the First Amendment, right? <laughs> and for our viewers who may not be familiar with Media Matters, do you want to give them a quick overview of what, what exactly Media right. Matters so, is? So Media Matters is a far left um, they call themselves a media watchdog, but really their main job is to smear conservatives and to smear um, Fox News or to smear anyone who really says anything bad about the Obama administration. And their tactics are to attack people personally. They try to get people fired. Um, they, try, they take comments out of context all of the time. Um, and they're funded by George Soros, who owns a lot of the media in this country. And uh, they work at, on a regular basis, obviously just described with the Obama administration at the Justice Department level, at the White House level, who knows what other agencies they're working with um, in terms of other topics, whether it's education, the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and then you have Media Matters funneling their talking points to MSNBC, who then puts them out, and, and then you have the, the media spin cycle on its own. So that's who Media Matters is. They are a, a tax-exempt, uh, very partisan outlet. <laughs> Can you talk about this coordination between the Justice Department and Media Matters attempts to smear you and others? Did you ever see a tangible uh, result from that? Did you see those, you know, aside from their behind the scenes orchestration of that, did you see those efforts to discredit you or smear you? Uh, did you ever feel threatened or bullied? Um, I would say no. Um, maybe that's a little brazen, <laughs> but I, I just I think that people know what Media Matters is. I think the bigger issue, you know, and what their point is, but I think the bigger issue is that you have a government or a taxpayer funded agency with Department of Justice and a woman who gets paid six figures a year and then gets benefits courtesy of taxpayers working to um, damage the reputation of people she simply disagrees with. Um, that's a government official attacking private citizens, journalists, whistleblowers because she disagrees and that's a little bit scary in terms of corruption and, and, and how you know the role of government um, in, in her power. I think that's a, a very scary thing that someone in the government is taking that initiative to personally attack people who don't have as much power as she does. So, we're getting <laughs> they'll some, just continue. Uh, they'll continue their, their stuff, but. We're getting some great questions from our, from our viewers, so let's go to some of those for a moment. Um, why wasn't this talked about in the debates? One person is uh, emailing, and I think that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I've heard uh, Mitt Romney and I've heard other uh, organizations talk a lot about, as I said before, Solyndra mm -hmm. and these green jobs failures, but this is a, a scandal with a human toll, and right. I've not seen debate moderators mm -hmm. or, or really the Romney campaign aggressively bringing this issue to light. Right. Well, you know, it, on the terms of the, the debate moder moderators who choose the questions, um, 
they're part of the media. They're the, you know, the, the journalists who are chosen to, to pick the, the questions. And I was hoping it would come up again in the foreign policy debate. It did come up in debate number two um, during a gun control discussion, um, which Mitt Romney, you know, didn't have the best chance to bring it up, but I'm really glad that he did because they weren't on the topic of Mexico. They were on the topic of AK-47s, and it gave him a perfect opening to say the problem with AK-47s in the past four years has been your administration sending them to Mexico. Um, and he discussed the, the human toll, but I would like it to be um, discussed further. Candy Crowley got involved and in, in, in cut off the conversation, and of course, President Obama didn't address it. There should have been a question about executive privilege. This is the first time with Fast and Furious that the President has asserted executive privilege. It's a topic that should be talked about when it comes to transparency and openness and the fact that this is a very lethal program. Um, and so, it should be coming up more. It should have come up more. It's disappointing that it didn't. Um, but I, I honestly think that Mitt Romney took the opportunity that he could um, to talk about it. And, and on the aspect of you know people, the media narrative has been that no one cares about this. Well, if you look at the polling, um, there was a poll that came out a couple months ago that showed economy is number one, but government corruption is number two. And so that's a pretty big deal when you have, you know, Obviously, the economy, which affects people on a very local level, you know, affects their everyday life. That's going to be number one. But when corruption is number two, Fast and Furious is the perfect example of corruption on so many levels. Um, and also, you know, Benghazi was part of the debate, and Benghazi used the same exact. The administration used the same exact playbook as they did with Fast and Furious, and, and they got a lot of blowback for it. Um, the good news is that you know. More people are paying attention with Benghazi, but they use the same exact tactics to try and cover that up. Now, another uh, another question from one of our viewers, and again, encourage all of you to email your questions to us at telford at franklincenterhq.org or contact us on Twitter at Katie Pavlich or at Blame Telford. How many legacy media outlets have uh, indeed contacted you about your book or your research? I'm sure you've done a lot of conservative talk radio and, mm -hmm. and friendly media, but when it comes to the legacy media, have any of them had you on? Have they talked about this? I've done a couple of radio shows that are considered you know, more objective outlets, but in terms of uh, legacy, no. Uh, like I mentioned, they, they ran with the story that's been proven false. They ran with the story that's been asked to be retracted multiple times by the Oversight Committee, by John Dodson, and then by uh, uh, other um, people in the blogosphere have asked for it to be retracted because none of it is, is backed up by evidence. And so they haven't asked. It hasn't happened, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Considering they ignored it, I wasn't surprised. Shocking. Shocking, Shocking they yes. wouldn't cover it. Mm -hmm. OK, another question uh, from one of our viewers today is, what has the reaction been in Mexico, I guess? Mm -hmm. uh, there are probably two dynamics to that. What's the reaction been, uh, the official reaction amongst the government there, and then right. you know, probably popular opinion, do they even know about it? Absolutely. So the official reaction from the Mexican government at first was outrage. Uh, the Mexican Attorney General was, there was a lot of, right away when she found out about it, uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, extraditing DOJ and ATF officials to Mexico to stand trial for trafficking guns into a foreign country without the Mexican government's knowledge. Now, the that official re, you know, reaction was tamped down heavily um, because there was a deal done, according to my sources, between the State Department and the government of Mexico saying, there's an election coming up, and if you want your Merida Initiative money, foreign aid, you better not talk about Fast and Furious from an official standpoint. Uh, I find it quite ironic that Mexican President Felipe Calderon, who claims to be very anti-gun, wants the United States to re-implement the assault weapons ban, lectures us all the time about the violence in our country, um, has been very silent on this. Um, yet he's always saying that we need more laws. Um, in terms of the unofficial reaction about what's happening in Mexico, I talked to a couple people who are actually from Mexico who say the trust there is very damaged. They're not sure if this was a program that was actually supposed to stop drug cartels, like ATF claimed, or whether this was an invasion of their sovereignty. Um, there's a lot of distrust there, um, and so that relationship is heavily damaged, and I think that's something that really needs to be addressed. We, we do a lot of trade with Mexico. Um, they're our southern neighbor. Um, clearly, we're there, you know, there's a lot of murder in Mexico that we have to address. 60,000 people since 2006, and our own government decided to contribute to that. Um, and so there's a lot of distrust and, and I think disappointment in the United States government in, in this program. Another question from one of our viewers. Uh, shouldn't this be a hard-hitting topic at all levels uh, of these campaigns, House and Senate candidates? 
uh, why aren't they talking about it? And, mm -hmm. uh, and if they are, who are the folks who are speaking up on this issue? Well, I know that Ted Cruz is talking about it um, in Texas. He's, he's talked about it multiple times. I know that um, um, Representative Gosar, who was on the Oversight Committee, has been talking about this in his campaign. Paul Ryan uh, and Mitt Romney have actually, from the past couple weeks, um, sent out multiple emails talking about how the Department of Justice, Eric Holder, needs to go. And the only way to do that clearly, considering um, President Obama stands in full faith and confidence um, with him, is, in their opinion, to change out the uh, administrations. And so it's been talked about a little bit. It's, it hasn't been talked about in the sense of you know, what I would like to see. Um, I think that the one thing looking back on this in history is going to be this is something um, tragically that didn't get as much attention as it should have and the people who were killed as a result deserve better. Absolutely. Great. Getting more questions from our viewers and again encourage you to email us at telford at franklincenterhq.org if, uh, if you have one as well. Uh, another great question here, uh, talking about Iran-Contra. Uh, mm -hmm. Somebody's recalling that that was hammered on the uh, evening news yeah. every single night. Of course, this was the pre-internet age. Do you feel that with all the coverage that's happening online through outlets like Town Hall and mm -hmm. uh, your, your other allies who've been covering this, do you feel that there's still the same level of coverage for this kind of scandal that may have happened before, uh, before tools like the internet were available to get news out? Um, I would say that it's been convenient for the big, net big networks not to cover it. They can get away with saying, well, the online community is covering it. We don't have to. Um, but I think that's just a, an excuse. I think that um, I don't think it would have been covered at all if it hadn't been for for um, bloggers and and then mainstream media kind of trying to pick it up through CBS. Um, and so I think you know the the new media has played a huge role in making sure people know about this because without it we wouldn't have known about it at all. They wouldn't have written the story. Whistleblowers would have gone to um, you know the Washington Post and said this is what's going on. They would have ignored it. Um, and so it's really given, you know, new media has really given people an opportunity to expose it. I don't think it would have happened without it. So thank God for the internet. Awesome. Thanks, Al Gore. Appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, another question. Do you feel that most of the information about the scandal is already, uh, already known, or do you feel that what we know is just the tip of the iceberg? I definitely think it's just the tip of the iceberg. If you just look at the sheer numbers of documentation that we've seen, out of 80,000 documents requested, uh, only 7,000 have been turned over, most of which are completely blacked out sheets of paper uh, for redaction. But there are 280,000 documents about Fast and Furious available. And so, and let's go back to, this was a program that ran across multiple federal government agencies. So of course there's hundreds of thousands of documents. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. As I said, Fast and Furious was an Arizona program. There were programs run out of Texas, which resulted in the death of Jaime, ICE agent Jaime Zapata in, tech, in, in Mexico. And then you had the gun walking program out of Florida as well. And so this is, you know, Fast and Furious on its own has a ton of information, but this was a, a national program despite what the president and the attorney general have to say. I would say this is just the tip of the iceberg. The Oversight Committee still has two, um, you know, 500-page reports coming out. Um, and the Inspector General, quite frankly, isn't done with, with his work either. So there's still a lot, a lot to go. And I know that in the 24-hour news cycle, it seems like this has been dragging on and on and on. But let's, let's remember that Watergate took three years to really get to the bottom of. And that was simply two guys breaking into a hotel room. You know, no one died in Watergate. This is a widespread program that was involved multiple government agencies. It was a huge program involved trafficking weapons into a foreign country. And so we're about a year and a half into the actual investigation of this, so I feel like we have quite a ways to go. <laughs> so patience is a virtue in this. Yeah, it's important not to get too impatient with the way that things go. One of our, <clears throat> our viewers observes that if this were a right-wing story, i.e. something from the Reagan or Bush administrations, it would have already been a movie starring George Clooney and Matt Damon mm -hmm. or a made-for-TV with Patrick Dempsey. Uh, are there any plans for a, for a movie? And uh, I would add to that, if so, who, who would you like to play you? Oh, <laughs> God. Um, well, it is funny. It's like maybe if you know, I was a liberal, people would you know, want to be playing me. Um, I don't know if I was a, a CNN correspondent. Who knows? Um, there isn't a movie in, in, in place yet. I know that there's been talk of some documentaries. Um, I just did a, actually a film with uh, Judicial Watch. It's more of a documentary about, uh, it's called The District of Corruption. It's actually out today. Um, and it goes through, you know, Fast and Furious is mentioned 
Um, and it, but it goes through, you know, a series of administrations and talking about just kind of the overall corruption that DC breeds. But that does touch on it. Um, like you said, I totally agree. It, this was something that uh, the mainstream media decided to cover, and it was against a Republican administration. Um, there would be a movie already, if not a sequel. So we'll see. It's it's almost like a rendition of All the King's Men, but in real real life. <laughs> so <laughs> who knows? What I don't know who I'd want to play me. I like um, what's the girl's name from Hunger Games? Oh, I can't think of her name. Well, the girl from Hunger Games, whatever her name is. Yeah, I like her. See so if we can get her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See if she's available. <laughs> uh, one last question from. Uh, from a citizen, and this is a great one, so thank you all for submitting your questions. Uh, what can we as citizens do to get the story more to the forefront? Letters to the editor, do those mm -hmm. work anymore? What can people do to get the word out? Letters to the editor, um, ombudsman at, at places like the Washington Post, contact CNN. I always say use social media uh, to engage large outlets. Uh, they do read their Twitter feeds, so engage people like CNN, MSNBC, um, and other people who you don't feel like have, have covered this in a substantial uh, way. Uh, use social media. Contact your congressman. I know that sounds silly. It's frustrating. But contact your representatives and let them know that they need to be looking into this. And I think that a lot of people are. I've talked to a lot of people on Capitol Hill, both Democrats and Republicans, who say, every town hall I go to, I get a question about this. Um, so for, you know, although that the media narrative is that, that it doesn't matter, it's over, Eric Holder has no responsibility in it, that's not true. People are still interested. We don't have very many answers, um, as we found today, in terms of who authorized it and who's really responsible for it. There hasn't been any accountability, and people aren't going to you know, be calling for more accountability from inside the Department of Justice. And so I would say just contact people through social media and call. And I would say, yeah, write, to, write letters to the editor. I think that was a, a great question and a, a great point by you as well about social media, the power of people mm -hmm. to get a message out, even if the mainstream media isn't with us, even yeah. if they're stonewalling or or ignoring, uh, you know, don't take for granted that people know about this. Make mm -hmm. sure you round up Katie's great work. I bet her book makes a, a great Christmas present. Yes. Where, where can folks buy your book, by the way? Uh, Amazon.com and at your uh, local Barnes & Noble. Now, one last question from me before we close out today. Uh, from the perspective of an established journalist and an, an author, somebody who works in this realm professionally, also somebody who's been around the country with us mm -hmm. at our Franklin Center Citizen Journalism trainings, what advice would you give to folks who want to get involved, who want to you know, whether it's providing coverage of this issue or breaking stories uh, unrelated to this in their local communities, yeah. what kind of uh, words of wisdom would you impart on them? I would first say that nothing is too big. I know that um, <clears throat> a lot of the time people feel overwhelmed with the story. Or they feel like it'll be very difficult. They feel like they're one person. They can't make a difference. And the fact is that you can, whether it's with starting a nonprofit um, or whether it's being a journalist on the ground in your local community. The second bit of advice I would give is you have to go make those connections and go to the meetings and figure out people. Because even though you know, government at all levels, local and federal, is very corrupt, as we know, there are good people, as we've talked about today, who are willing to stand up for the rule of law and who are willing to do the right thing, despite knowing that they might lose their job over it. So you have to go and find those people and let them know that you're someone they can trust and someone they can talk to about what's going on inside their agency. As we've seen with all the stonewalling, majority of the time, the only information you're getting is from people on the inside. And so it's very important to take advantage of those relationships, but you have to go and build them. So I know that um, especially, you know, people feel like, well, I have, you know, a regular life. I have to pay my bills. I have a regular job. I have kids. Um, and, you know, but it's really important to go to the city council meetings. And as Franklin always says, you know, people change their behavior even when people are watching. Um, and so it's good to just go and make those connections. So I would say nothing is too big. Take on a big story if you feel like it's necessary. And also make sure you're making those connections with people who can really give you valuable information um, and, and make your life easier in terms of providing information. No, I lied. We'll do one more question, I guess. <laughs> okay. I'm a liar, so the DOJ will have to hire me. Yes, but exactly. Couldn't, couldn't resist on this one. Uh, one of our viewers writes, hi, Katie. I've been following you since your days at the University of Arizona oh, cool. here in Tucson. My question is about ATF agent Hope McAllister. Mm -hmm. Has she testified or given any statement after reading your book? I feel she has a lot of info uh, and uh, that she could tell everyone either way. Right. Well, Hope McAllister is one of the um, ATF agents who was in a lot of hot water. She was the, the case agent for Fast and Furious, basically in charge of it on the, the ground level, and then she had her supervisors. Um, 
She hasn't testified, as far as I know, to the House Oversight Committee. Um, I'm not sure why she hasn't testified. I'm not sure if she's been subpoenaed. Um, I do believe the Inspector General talked to her um, for his report, but she's not really saying anything because she has a lot on the line. I mean, she's just as guilty and has, has been named and referred to um, for discipline as Bill Newell and Bill McMahon. And so she's one of the, the villains in the story. And we haven't heard a lot about her, but she definitely knows um, a lot about what's going on. And another person who I'd like to see more about is ICE agent Lane France, who was a co-case agent with her, who every report that was filed with ATF and the Justice Department on Fast and Furious was also filed with Homeland Security. And so that's the kind of lead in to the Homeland Security angle on how much they knew and how much involvement that they had. Um, so, you know, haven't been able to reach her. If anyone has her number, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's great that a viewer has been following you since your, your yeah, college days. Cool. And yeah. just as we, as we close out here for any aspiring journalists out there, could you maybe tell folks how you got your start and what your path has been? I just drove in. I was, you know, I went to obviously the University of Arizona, uh, thought I was going to do business and go to law school, got to college, decided college wasn't really my thing, wanted to be a sports journalist, uh, did an internship and then completely changed over to you know, the political angle of things and, and more investigative work. Um, I worked at my local college TV station, um, um, and then I went on a weekly radio show every week to discuss what was happening inside my classrooms and the things that the professors were saying. And that started out as a 10-minute segment every week, which turned into an hour, because people were very interested on what was going on inside the classroom um, and what professors were saying that wasn't necessarily uh, in the curriculum. Um, and then I did an internship for Town Hall and moved here after graduation, and here I am. So I just worked really hard and decided that nothing was going to be too big, and um, look where it brought me. <laughs> and you're doing some great work, and uh, we appreciate oh, you being here with us today. We appreciate all of our viewers who've taken the time to join us today and all throughout the week as well. Uh, we'll continue to bring you more uh, great webinars in the future. Hope you'll all tune in and stay involved. Uh, you can go to watchdogwire.com to sign up as a citizen journalist if you want to get involved. And again, thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you to the Leadership Institute for making this possible. And thank you to Kitty Pavlich. Thank you so much.